Are you struggling to pass the CPA exam? Did your review course fail to fit your learning style? I'm Darius Clark of I-75 CPA Review, where the right teacher makes all the difference. And every day I'm on the CPA exam Facebook groups, either getting thanked by someone who passed or being asked to answer a question so now I have a couple of Facebook groups that you can join so that you could pass the exam and thank me. One of those groups is the CPA exam support and tutoring group run by Darius Clark and Andrew Katz. And the other group is the Amazing Women of I-75 CPA Review. While the Amazing Women group is moderated by women, men are absolutely allowed to join and we have over a thousand men as members. You can join both groups and look for me. I'll be answering questions. Now, in this video, we're going to look at the factors that determine sample size. On the exam, it's not always the exact number of the sample that you need, but when must the sample size increase, and when can the auditor get away with a smaller sample size than originally thought? And we're going to use sampling for attributes, which means we're going to test controls. For example, assume that there's a control in the client company in the revenue cycle that all sales orders of over $1,000 must have a special credit check performed and then the credit manager will add a code number to the sales order if the customer's credit is good and this is important because the company will usually ship out their merchandise before they get paid and they'll often give 30 days for their customers to pay with maybe even two percent off if they pay within 10 days so as long as their customers have good credit there's really no problem with doing that as long as the credit check is performed before the goods are shipped out. So the auditor might want to test that control to make sure that the credit manager is adding a code number to the sales order to indicate validity whenever the sales are over $1,000. The auditor would be interested in how often the control is not done properly because that knowledge will impact the auditor's assessment of control risk here in the revenue cycle. The goal of a sample is to select enough items so that the sample is representative of the population as a whole. Now, assuming the auditor is going to sample a population of 100,000 sales orders, how big should the sample size be? 300 items? Do we have to look at 3,000 sales orders to see if this control is working? And we said one of the most important questions on the exam is not how big the sample is, but when does the sample size have to be increased? And when can the auditor get away with a smaller sample size? And that's the factors that we're going to look at right now. Step one in determining the sample size is to anticipate the actual error rate in the population. So in sampling for attributes, testing controls, the auditor first specifies the problem being estimated and anticipates the actual error rate, also known as deviation rate. When you see the word deviation, it means the same thing as error. The auditor's expected error rate in the population of sales orders is based on the difficulty of the task of the credit manager and how well the credit manager understands her role. Remember what the control is. The credit manager is supposed to somehow initial or add a code number to every sales order when the dollar value is over $1,000 to indicate that the customer has good credit before the goods are shipped out. For example, assume that the auditor is concerned that orders of over $1,000 were not properly verified for credit approval by the credit manager. And let's assume that the auditor expects 2% errors to occur in the population. That means the auditor feels that the credit manager gets it right 98% of the time. If the credit manager is expecting 2% error, it's all based on 100%. So if we're expecting 2% error, then we think 98% of the time it must be done properly. Now, if that expected error rate were to rise from 2% error expected to 3% error expected, then the sample size must be increased. And the opposite is true. If the auditor expected less errors from, let's say, 2% error to only 1% error, then the sample size could be reduced. Let's try this question. An auditor is testing controls. If the auditor determines that more errors exist in the population than was originally expected, one, this discovery will necessitate a smaller sample size. No, 
this discovery will mean you're going to need a bigger sample size because the order is expecting more errors than was originally expected. Two, this sampling technique is known as sampling for variables. No, it says the auditor is testing controls, so we're sampling for attributes. The answer is D, neither. So let's go with D. Neither of these is correct. All right, step two in determining sample size, we need to know the tolerable deviation rate. I thought we just looked at that in step one. No, step one was the expected error rate. The auditor determined that maybe 2% error is expected in the population, but how much error could the auditor tolerate? What's the highest error that could be present before the auditor would feel that the control activity was not reliable? The tolerable rate will always have to be set by the auditor higher than the expected error rate. So this is called the tolerable error rate where the auditor sets a limit for how much error can be tolerated in this control in order to say that this control is functioning and working normally. Obviously for very significant controls, the tolerable rate will be low, but for less important controls or where there's a compensating control, another control that could compensate for this one if it's not working, then the auditor can afford for the tolerable rate to be higher. And based on auditor's professional judgment, the auditor will set a limit for how much error can be tolerated in the population and still feel that the control activity is reliable. The importance of the activity, as well as the possible presence of other controls, will both influence the auditor's tolerable deviation rate. For example, in looking at credit verification of sales orders by the credit manager, the auditor might use professional judgment to set a tolerable deviation rate of 5%. What does that mean? It means as long as it's being done properly 95% of the time, the auditor is satisfied with a 5% error rate. As the tolerable deviation rate rises, the required sample size will decrease. This is because as the auditor could tolerate more and more error in the population, the auditor doesn't have to see as much sample. But the opposite's also true. As the tolerable deviation rate falls, the required sample size would have to increase. So if the auditor decided, can't tolerate much error here, thought we could tolerate 5% error, now we can only tolerate 4% error and the tolerable deviation rates going down, the sample size would have to increase. So far, the two factors that determine sample size is this tolerable deviation rate, which we said 5% we could tolerate. We could tolerate 5% error and still be okay with the control. And then what about that first factor in determining sample size? How much error in the population do we expect? We might expect only 2% error, but we could tolerate 5%. Both of those factors are important in determining sample size. Which of the following factors is considered in determining the sample size for a test of controls? Expected error or deviation rate? Yes, we said that might be 2%. We expect errors of 2% in the population. That's important in determining sample size. Two, tolerable error or deviation rate. Yes, that's also important. We said we could tolerate errors up to 5%. So both of these are correct. Letter C is the answer because both the expected error rate and the tolerable error rate are needed to determine sample size. How about this one? Which is correct regarding sampling for attributes? One, as the expected error rate rises, the sample size will need to increase. Yes. So if we originally thought 2% error in the population, and now we're thinking more like 3% error in the population, going to need a bigger sample size. Two, as the tolerable error rate rises, the sample size will need to be increased. No. If the auditor could tolerate more error in the population, then you don't need to look at as much. So as the tolerable error rate rises, the sample size could decrease. That means one is correct, but two is wrong. Letter A is the answer. How about this? Which of the following factors will influence the auditor's tolerable deviation rate for a test of controls? One, the possible presence of other controls. Sure, because if there's other controls compensating for this one, then the tolerable rate could be higher. Two, the importance of the activity. Yes, because if the activity is particularly important to the company, then the tolerable rate will be lower. Both of these are correct. Let's go with C. And now step three in determining sample size, the allowable level of sampling risk. In sampling, there's always a chance that the sample will be misleading and have characteristics different from the population. 
So the auditor establishes how much risk is allowable that the sample will be different from the population. The auditor sets a limit for how reliable the overall sample needs to be. The auditor doesn't look at every item, so in the end, the sample may not be representative of the total population. So how confident does the auditor need to be that the sample represents the population? That confidence level is based on 100% and is known as the allowable level of sampling risk. For example, the auditor might only need to be 90% confident that the sample represents the population. If that's the case and the auditor is only going to be 90% confident that the sample represents the population, then the auditor is taking a 10% sampling risk because it's all based on 100%. So if the auditor is going to randomly select a given number of sales orders, say 100, out of a population of 100,000 to sample the 100 to see how many times the credit manager failed to verify credit before the goods were shipped, it's certainly possible that a sample of 100 out of 100,000 could contain no errors. And if that's the case and the sample contained no errors, then the auditor would conclude that the population of sales orders contains few, if any, errors. Therefore, the control is reliable. That would be the auditor's most likely conclusion if the 100 sampled sales orders contain no errors. The problem with that is that sample might be misleading. Those 100 sales orders might not have any errors, but we didn't look at all 100,000. And we're not going to look at all 100,000. So we need to recognize the fact that there's an allowable level of sampling risk out there that the sample is not going to be representative of the population. How big of a risk is the auditor willing to take? So if the auditor found no instances of the credit check being missed in the sample of 100 sales orders out of 100,000, that means the auditor's sample may have contained a disproportionate number of correct items. There's always a risk that the population of 100,000 may have been full of errors, but the sample didn't reflect the true state of the population. We call that what? The allowable level of sampling risk. And the auditor sets a limit for how much chance he's willing to take that the sample does not represent the population. This is known as the allowable level of sampling risk. And as an illustration, if we're looking at the credit verification of sales orders, 10% could be viewed as an allowable level of sampling risk. This means that the auditor is okay being just 90% confident that the sample is reliable and that the sample actually represents the population. The auditor can never be 100% confident that the sample represents the population because the auditor is not examining every sales order in the population of 100,000. But you have to know for the exam, as the auditor wants to reduce the allowable level of sampling risk from 10%, maybe down to 5%, that means you're going from 90% confidence to 95% confidence. As the need for reliability and confidence increases from 90% to 95%, the number of items needed for a representative sample will increase. That means sample size needs to go up when you want to get closer to 100% confident. And we see this every year during election season, right? Where they take a poll and they tell us the poll has a plus or minus 5% confidence. That means they're 95% confident that what they're telling you is reliable. If they want to say plus or minus 2%, then they're trying to be 98% confident. They'd have to call more registered voters than they called already. Because if you want to go from 95% confidence to 98% confidence, the sample size would have to increase. But if you don't mind going the other way from 98% confidence to 95% confidence, you can get away with a smaller sample size. And remember, we're always trying to determine the effect on sample size of any of these three factors. And what are the three factors? One, the order estimates the actual error rate in the population. Let's say 2% is the expected error rate. That means we think that the credit manager gets it right 98% of the time and messes up only 2% of the time. Then the auditor sets a limit for tolerable error rate. We can tolerate 5% error even though we only expect 2% error. We expect the credit manager to get it right 98% of the time, but if she gets it right only 95% of the time, we're okay with that. The tolerable rate will always be higher than the estimated error rate. And then three, the auditor sets that limit for the allowable level of risk 
that the sample is not representative of the population. Maybe we want to be 90% confident that the sample represents the population, so that means we're willing to take a 10% sampling risk. All three of these factors go into determining sample size, and all three of these factors are based on auditor's professional judgment. No statistics, no fancy math. All this is based on, so far, auditor's professional judgment. So even if the exam tells you you're doing statistical sampling, there's still a fair amount of human judgment involved in statistical sampling. Because when it comes to determining sample size, these three factors are based on judgment. Are there any other factors in determining sample size for a test of controls? Nope, just these three. Let's try this one. An auditor is estimating an error rate for a test of controls. The auditor must set a level of sampling risk that is viewed as acceptable. So do this question for homework and leave me the answer in the comments section. And don't forget to like and subscribe because it helps the channel out a lot. And if you found this video easy to follow, get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark where the right teacher makes all the difference. Get on I-75 and be home soon.